Hi everyone, my name is James Feeney. Welcome to or back to my channel. Today we are here with a book review. As I mentioned that I would do on this here book, which I'm going to need to have to read the title. It's not the most intuitive to remember. So we have The Tarot, Magic, Alchemy, Hermeticism, and Neoplatonism by Robert M. Place. <laughs> this is one that is that many are familiar with it is widely known and spoken about but I haven't seen much in terms of offering I would say an insight into what the contents are of this book so I'd want to offer that especially because I know many debate about this book and it's not necessarily the easiest to obtain for everybody given that I don't think you can really just pick it up on eBay I could be wrong I just know it's a heavy book and I've seen people talk about the shipping costs and I know it's one that seems like quite an undertaking, so some people are more wary or trepidatious when it comes to the purchasing of this book. And so if I can help anybody out there make an informed purchase on whether they think this book would be right for them or not, all the better. And I think it might just be fun for anybody who has read this to hear somebody else's thoughts. I'm always looking to hear others' thoughts on things that I have read or that I enjoy as well. So yes, stick around. And so we will get right into the content. So I'm going to take us through like how the book is broken up or how I see it really to be broken up into parts. So we have the first major section. So we start with an introduction, which gives us some background on Robert M. Place's introduction to tarot, the system of tarot, how he entered the world of tarot and became interested. So I think that's something he's mentioned in a few of his books, because I have read another of his books where he gave the story, basically the same story. Then we start with really a history of the subjects of, of magic, alchemy, hermeticism, and neoplatonism through a lens of culture, through a lens of history. So we start with more pre-recorded hist like pre-recorded history. So yeah, going back thousands of years to ideas. Really, it starts with ideas of shamanism as they connect to these things. So it is all building up towards these topics, but these are all very integral parts in the history of said topics that then will lead into tarot. So we start with, I believe it's shamanism, which the etymology of that word is rooted in Siberia. So it really is, it's a term that's used to categorize a set of practices. Now what's interesting is that these practices or very similar practices existed and arose independently across a lot of the world, across many cultures, in, in Native North Americans, in so Native South Americans, in Ireland and the UK, in Eastern Europe, in many, many countries, in Africa, the continent of Africa. So we have the idea of shamanism and the practices that shamanism connotes. Of course, the actual root of the word is Siberian, but the practices described through said word exist independently, very similar ones at least, so that the word is actually used to describe that set of practices that can be found within all of these cultures. So it's kind of this uniting force in the beginning. We then work our way through Egypt and various religious mythological. So you do get to know myths about various topics in terms of shamanism and Egyptian mythology and actual Egyptian history and what they thought in terms of magic and ideas of the soul and societal structures that all influence philosophies that influence modern day ideas and practices of magic and how we work with tarot as tarot is a, a, an accumulation of various philosophies religious ideas spiritual knowledge that have taken place over many thousands of years so start with shamanism work into egypt then we get into the mediterranean area so greece we start to look at philosophers and we delve into specific people. So there's uh, Pythagoras and his idea who he came up with the idea of emanations. So a source that becomes many, that's, that's a big theme going on, how the seven planets were all incorporated in these various cultures and how ideas changed. We have Alexander the Great, we have various uh, Egyptian rulers, and we have, for example, uh, Mesopotamia and these old, old religious uh, well, cultures and their religious practices and beliefs and how they arrived at certain things and what we know of them today 
through various uh, findings in archaeology. So the first, I would say, half of this book, it, at least the half, the first half of this book, is really a history of those sorts of things. We work our way up through the Mediterranean, through Greece. Eventually, it starts to work its way over into Europe by means of the, the Middle East and Spain and North Africa kind of culminating and getting into European culture where we start to see how that emerges and how European culture is influenced by various ideas that had circulated over the continents and very interesting. So we were looking at things that are very, I would say there's a great emphasis placed on philosophy. There's a great emphasis placed on ideologies that pertain, of course, to alchemy, hermeticism, neoplatonism. We get into secret societies. We get into, of course, as it gets later and later, we get into the Golden Dawn. And then when Tarot naturally enters the, the paradigm or historical context is when we start to speak about Tarot. So Tarot, as we know, it really didn't arrive until I believe the way that Robert M. Poise has studied and found it to be Tarot that we might even recognize isn't really present until the 1400s. So it's not nearly as old as I think I thought it was. And so he goes through that and how we arrived at even more modern systems that we have come to use being very new, relatively speaking, in terms of history, but that the the beliefs and the influences and the practices and the cultures that influenced it are all going back quite far and draw, that people drew from those things coming into the present and that there is this sort of uh, continuity throughout and that there are really fun stories along the way. So if you're interested in any of basically the topics that are listed in the title, you're going to get a history, you're going to get a rundown, uh, a crash course in all of these subjects and their history and the the makeup of the contents of what that subject really gets at and is. So that's the first half of the book. It's not at all referencing even the card decks connected to this book. So I was under the impression that it was basically just the entirety of the book would be a guidebook to these two decks, the Alchemical Tarot and the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery. Now, these decks are heavily referenced and there is a point in time in the book that is allocated to describing each and every card from both of these decks, going through in a comparative way. But I would say the first half of the book is really just a history and understanding a course on, honestly, magic, alchemy, hermeticism, neoplatonism, along with philosophy, religion, spirituality, all of that is basically the first half of the book. So you could really just read that first half, not have either of the decks and still get a lot out of this. I know I did, and I wasn't expecting the contents of the book to operate in such a way, but I was pleasantly surprised. Now, if you are really just looking for this to be a guidebook, it's not to say that you'll be disappointed, but the majority of it is really not a guidebook in any strict sense. I mean, it references the history of tarot, so you get to know various systems that were created, people who made the various types of art, who commissioned them, why a certain symbol was one way and what was written about it, how it evolved, how somebody else took it to mean, and how it how it became what it did. So if you're interested in the history of tarot, this is also a really great one. You get to know about the, it is as much a guidebook, I think, for the Rider Waite Smith deck as it is for both of the decks I just mentioned, the Alchemical Tarot and the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery. As we get to where the cards are directly referenced, there's a good bit on each of the majors. I'm trying to see. So you'll get, for example, the Rider Waite Smith. You'll get a rundown on the Rider Waite Smith card. You'll get the Alchemical Tarot. Uh, yeah, the Alchemical Tarot card, and then you'll get the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery. A lot of them also reference the Marseille. So there is, for a decent amount of the cards, there is reference to the to the Marseille. So you're getting a little bit of everything here. I would say that, of course, the the idea is really for him to let you know about these two, but it's really about how he was influenced by the Rider Waite Smith. So there is a lot written about this, and he'll mention how he potentially deviates, how he remains true to the Rider Waite Smith, how the Rider Waite Smith either deviated or stayed true to Marseille, which it was to a degree based on, along with the Attila and the Sola Busca, which he mentions as well, and. So we go through that with each of the cards. So the symbols are spoken about, the ideas that go into the card. There are uh, excerpts from uh, Levi, El I'm gonna mispronounce his name, Eliphas Levi. There's quotes from 
from Mr. Waite himself. There are quotes from various texts along with reference pictures that potentially have some sort of pertinence to various cards, artworks that depict certain scenes, philosophies, beliefs that may have influenced the cards, and he'll let you know what those are. The majors get quite a bit for each card, a few pages. So there's a lot of really great historical context of breakdown of the imagery. So you're really understanding everything that's going on. Super, super helpful and interesting if you're into knowing the background, knowing the history, knowing what each and every little symbol might mean, various interpretations and the evolution of that idea or that archetype. If you're interested in that, this will be great. And of course, you can always just skip to the parts that speak to the alchemical tarot or the tarot of the sevenfold mystery, if that's really all you're looking for. But there's not so much specifically just written about those cards. So you may be disappointed if you pick this up thinking it was just a guidebook and finding that there's only a few little paragraphs or a paragraph or two very specifically written about each card. But I found it to be really interesting because knowing the history, he Robert M. Place draws upon the history for his deck. So when you know the history, you know more about his cards indirectly, but you still know more. So there's that bit. And then we get into the minors. There's a decent amount written about the aces, the twos, and sometimes the threes. And then he tends to shorten it down back to a page of writing for all of the rest of the minors in the courts. They're still very interesting. You still get excerpts from uh, Levi and Wait and references to the Attila and the Solabusca and older versions of Marseille, as well as, uh, what else? Artworks and philosophies that tie in. And then you'll get how he either chose to deviate, why he chose, for example, a rabbit to, to really be a key figure in the, the pentacle suit or the disc suit. So you get some really interesting background there. It is very clear. It is concise, especially with the minors, because you're getting a page. So he really condenses it for you. I would say that the amount spent actually depicting here, I'll show you how long it is. The amount depicting the actual majors and letting you know about them is okay this much is allocated for really digging into the specific cards in both the rider Wade smith the tarot of the sevenfold mystery and the alchemical tarot along with some marseille attila solabusca references this much is given to just speaking about this very specific cards this beginning portion right here is where we get that history now towards the end of the history the history is really just pertaining to the tarot but then I would say that for example like we don't get to the tarot part of the history until like he like so this part is not tarot and like we get to tarot maybe around like here so it is interesting and then of course the history will sh like shy away from or deviate from tarot as it needs to and then return to it so you'll get things on the golden dawn of course as it gets more close to modern day you'll get, I, ooh, I thought this was interesting. So the way he spoke of various key figures in terms of like their connection to modern tarot systems was interesting. So he very clearly likes Pamela Coleman Smith. I mean, I think we all do. She's amazing, her art's amazing, and there's a lot written about her that is, is nice and really cool. And I tend to be a fan of hers as well. So he clearly likes her based on the way he speaks of her. He doesn't seem to be so keen or fond of uh, Mr. Waite. He, I wouldn't say speaks disparagingly, but he kind of makes it clear that he doesn't think he deserves as much credit, which to some regards, in some regards, I do agree. I think that there is a lot more credit that should be given to Pamela Coleman Smith, and that maybe some things that Waite took credit for were kind of more of Pamela's making, and it was nice to know more about her and her history. So you do get little biographies on a lot of these key figures. He spoke... I didn't like the way he spoke about the Thoth tarot. You may have watched my channel and know that I am a Thoth deck user. I, I use the Thoth deck. That's my primary deck and or system. And I don't like the way he spoke on it. Now, I understand his criticisms of Crowley. That I do understand. I didn't really like the way he kind of just spoke down about the system because he didn't like Crowley. And he kind of just made it seem inferior and inconsequential in terms of tarot, which... I was not a fan of. And also, he kind of put down Lady Frida Harris in a way that didn't feel right, it didn't feel warranted. So he almost compared her and Pamela Coleman Smith's art styles, and 
called, he basically called Lady Frida Harris a mediocre artist and Pamela Coleman Smith one of, of notoriety and fame and acclaim because of course Pamela Coleman Smith had was made a career out of art and had exhibitions and her art was used and all sorts of things and she was in galleries so that is true but Lady, Lady Frida Harris didn't try to really make I mean she did go to school for art and she wanted to kind of make a career of art but it wasn't the same like you know what I mean and when we look at for example now, I'm not trying to compare the two either, but when we look at the art style of the Thoth versus the Rider Waite Smith, I would say that the Thoth kind of looks a little bit more complex. It looks more nuanced. It looks more difficult, technically speaking, art style wise. So, for him to call Lady Frida Harris a mediocre artist and to really bolster the, the views of Pamela Coleman Smith, that's not to say she's undeserving or a lesser artist than Lady Frida Harris at all. But to compare them and then to call Lady Frida Harris basically mediocre didn't sit right with me. So there's that. That's probably my one qualm with this book. It's an amazing book. That's very much a subjective, personal, I don't know, just a bone to pick. So we get to that end point where we get to the end of the reference of the cards and then we get this little back portion. Now this is actually a really nice nugget of knowledge, a nice little area. And I highly recommend if you're reading this that you don't just stop here. Yes, you may have know how to work with the cards, you may know the basics of tarot, but I still find this little section interesting. So this is where he would go into how it is that he potentially recommends reading the cards, spreads, activities, there's even activities for magic with the cards, and ceremonial magic, meditations, exercises, so this is really nice, this little bit right here. I like the way he described working with the cards in laying out sets of three. So he really emphasizes for any given question, laying out three cards. And then he has these really cool ideas of based on how figures are facing or what they're doing and that affecting what it's basically saying. Is it more of a linear approach to your inquiry through the three cards? Is it, so you have these things broken down. I found that to be extremely interesting. The way he even does spreads is really in three cards for a position. So the spreads, keep that in mind, and then he'll go through how that works. And it is there is a continuity between this approach to reading and the way he describes the cards, because when he talks about a lot of his minor cards, especially, he will reference the direction that they're facing. So there's bits on the, the pips or the minors, and he will talk about, for example, what is to... Now, this is like a mirror thing, but this crow is, or this blackbird is flying to the left. So he'll be like, what's going on to the left of it? Turn to that card for uh, an example of what, like a certain thing. And he says that a lot with a lot of the cards. So he loves looking at the directionality of figures and things going on in the cards to help you to read and to get an understanding of a situation. He emphasizes the ideas of creating a story out of the cards and it being more of a narrative experience. Uh, the spreads that he has are really interesting, I find. There's also more of a chakra or soul center spread where he references the, the connection between Eastern and Western philosophies of soul centers or energy points in the body and Pythagoras', Pythagoras ideas of creating the, the seven musical scales that can be connected to the aspects of the body and how they align very closely with the ideas of chakras. So there's a reading for that and the reading's complex, but really interesting. Well, it's not so complex, but you do have, for example, three cards for each chakra and it's just very interesting. So you get spreads like that. You get meditation exercises and ways of honing your focus in terms of reading tarot. And then there's some more uh, ceremonial magic exercises where you can work your way through the major arcana to get a better understanding or to potentially evoke or invoke. I'm not sure which. I'm trying to think of what means what. You can call out basically and summon an archetype and he has a little ritual ceremony where he goes into how to go about doing that and how one might go about doing that. I would say it's like an informal approach to ceremonial magic which seems a little bit contradictory but when I read it it didn't feel like that at all and so that last little bit actually packed a punch it was very short and quick but I really enjoyed seeing how it is that he recommends working with the cards and does go about working with the cards I think I might actually try some of these spreads and approaches because they do seem different from how it is that I would go about reading tarot so 
that pr pretty much takes us to the end. I thought that the history portions in the beginning and the diagrams he has on various concepts that then permeated various other cultures and concepts and philosophies, it was so interesting. So highly, re highly recommend reading this from front to back. I don't think it's one that is very reference style. I think it does kind of follow a almost the narrative of human existence with, of course, emphasis on the various subject matter depicted and t spoken about in the in the title. So it's human history from the beginning, but through this lens, if that makes sense. And then we get into the tarot and his specific decks, as well as how to work with the cards. So I find all of that super interesting. If that, if any of that sounded interesting, let me know. If you've read this book, let me know what you thought. If you think I missed something or there's something that you would like to add so that others who are watching this might be better informed, please comment below and let me know what it is that you would want to add in terms of um, speaking about this book so that others can be informed. And let me know if you're thinking about this and if you have any questions about it that I maybe didn't address so that I can answer them in the comments. So like and subscribe if this was helpful and fun for you. I hope you are all well and until next time, bye.